Thank you so much, Renata. And um, I'm profoundly honored uh, to be here for this opportunity. Uh, to Susan and Moya, um, it's really um, an honor to be here. And I wrote this paper for you. Um, and it has dug up a lot of methodological as well as, well as psychoanalytical uh, problems, and I think um, only Freud could uh, deal with those. <laughs> it is entirely possible that it was during a warm summer afternoon amid a sweaty, testosterone-filled basketball game between Le Corbusier, his cousin Pierre Janaret, and their friend Gabriel Gavrekian that the radical idea of Siam was conceived. Apparently, according to Gavrakian, these games were awkward for everyone because Le Corbusier insisted on wearing his, quote, little wire basket over his good eye. He was blind in the other one. A, co a couple of years earlier, at age 25, Gavrakian had won the first prize for his Garden of Water and Light at the 1925 Exposition for Decorative Arts in Paris followed by the designs of two cubist gardens in southern France. Now, in 2008, he organized Siam's first congress. Gevrekian had introduced the French-Swiss patron, Hélène de Mandreau, to Le Corbusier. The two, along with Jean Arrêt, Swiss art historian Sigmund Gideon, Bauhaus director Hannes Meyer, and 19 other leading architects were her guests in the Chateau de la Saras. And this is a costume party they had. <laughs> <laughs> in three days, these architects drafted CM's manifesto that aimed to place the new architecture into its, quote, true economic and social environment, unquote. La Saras declaration outlined their stance on the relationship between architecture and the state. Manifesto point seven, architecture's new attitude according to which it aims of its own volition to resituate itself within economic reality renders all claim to official patronage superfluous. Outwardly counterintuitive, uh, counter yet completely in line with the doctrine of modernism, the idea of art for art's sake, these architects pledged to place architecture back in its socioeconomic context, instituted and initiated an autonomizing discourse that aimed to split design from politics. This call for the profession to divorce from the state, a deceptive walking away from politics, endowed political power of its own volition to the modernist architect. Subsequently, prominent architects appealed to heads of states in order to realize their, their utopian mega projects. As Cohen notes, Le Corbusier systematically tried to create a relationship with leaders above the political machine, considering democracy an obstacle to his projects. <laughs> the modern movement thus mounted an autonomizing discourse which handed architects the agency to if not completely defined, by, but certainly shape the image of their relationship with political institutions. In April 1929, Walter Gropius resigned and was replaced by Meyer as the director of Bauhaus, who was in turn dismissed by the South mayor for the politicization of the school. He cursed everyone and he left for proletarian bright Moscow. Classes resumed under Mies, who expelled politicized students and streamlined the curriculum to focus on technology and aesthetics. These changed little. When in 1931 the Nazis gained power in the South, they vowed to simply demolish Gropius' building. As the Bauhaus came under attack, Siam intensified its activities and amassed German-speaking members under Gavrakian's chairmanship between 1928 and 32. By the time of its 1930 Congress, Gropius, Mies, and Richard Neutra had joined the organization. 
In the same year, together with Mallette Stevens, Henri Sauvage, and Auguste Perret, Gavrekian launched L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. It's a journal that is still is published. He then joined 32 architects to partake in Vienna's Workpont exhibition under Joseph Frank's direction. <coughs> Open in 1932, it received 100,000 visitors and was praised as the greatest architectural exhibition in Europe. Frank had been Gevrekian's teacher when in 1915, at the age of 15, he had arrived from Tehran and had begun his architectural education at Vienna's Academy of Applied Arts. By then, he was at home in five languages, having been born to Christian Armenian parents from Istanbul, raised in Tehran, educated in Vienna, and trained in Paris. After graduation, he had entered the atelier of Joseph Hoffman, leaving for Paris in 1922 to, partake, uh, to partner with Malay Stevens. By 1932, Grev Gevrekian had reached such status in the modern movement that his minimalist dwelling was featured at the center of the exhibition with those of Neutra and Adolf Loos. So this is um, his, his um, duplex, uh, like very minimalist with piloti and all the modernist uh, uh, um, um, principles. And then here you see, um, this is Gevdekian's um, duplex. And then you have Richard Neutra and these, this, these all four are losses. Um, and this is an interior of um, Gevdekian's unit. In October 1933, the Nazi party shut down the Bauhaus, while Siam's Fourth Congress in Moscow was canceled. Despite the highly successful exhibition, the Austrian Workbund dissolved in 1934. The leaders of the modern movement were on the run. Gevrekian, on his part, accepted Iranian government's invitation as Tehran's chief architect. Sometimes during 1933, he arrived in Iran amid the biggest construction boom since Shah Abbas the Great. It was a modernist dream come true. Reza Shah had demolished two thirds of the Rajar urban fabric, opening up a tabula rasa upon which various architects were rewarded for erecting a new Iran. If the tides had turned against the left leaning modern movement all over Europe, in Iran, the state had embarked on the enormous task of creating the modern middle class and of urbanizing Iran's city. Iran, a country that was as big as France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Italy combined, and as rich as its deep oil reservoirs. Ruled by a heavy-handed monarch bent on top-down modernization, the Iran of the 1930s was indeed a modernist dream come true. My initial inqu inquiry for tonight's talk began with a simple question. Why, given the staunchly nationalist environment of Reza Shah's reign, did so many of the leading local architects, the pioneers of the Iranian avant-garde movement, like Gevrekian, come from Iran's religious minorities? Or rather, how come so many young professionals from Christian, Baha'i, Jewish and Zoroastrian communities chose the field of architecture as their careers and hugely succeeded in designing so much of Iran's modernist built environment. I would like to propose here that Reza Shah's push for modernization created an inadvertent affirmative action organism from within which professional architects from the margins of various minorities as pioneers of modernity rose to the challenge of building the secular nation. In terms of architecture, the early Pahlavi nationalization project was both a top-down commitment to a secular modernization process that was in big part about the image of modernity as such and therefore could, not, could but embrace its own margins. And a bottom-up Confidence and participation in the state's nation building project by its minorities, be it religious, ethnic, or gender. In trying to answer these questions, I would like to piece together three interlocked historical inconsistencies. 
the apolitical claims of the modern movement in architectural culture between 1920s and World War II, despite the overwhelming dependence on political leaders. Reza Shah's affirmative action policies between 1922 and 41, despite Iran's adamant commitment to <coughs> Persian ethno-nationalism. And three, the strategies of marginality as pioneers of modernity through, throughout the Pahlavi era, despite the homogenizing processes of nationalism. These three seemingly inconsist seeming inconsistencies overlap and cross-pollinate in specific ways within the specific context of Pahlavi Iran that if examined closely, which I don't have the time uh, to do it here, reveals the conditions that created the unique historic moment in which Iranian mo modernist architect, especially those fr drawn from Zoroastrian, Baha'i, Armenian, Assyrian, and female communities emerged as the pioneers of modernity. Before jumping in, though, I, I want to <laughs> merely allude um, uh, here to Iran's cultural ethos of inclusion, even at the zenith of nationalism, owing in part to its monarchical legacy. The institution of Persian kingship, and uh, which Susan and I have tried to do in that book, um, trace in that book, has historically fostered a sociopolitical uh, socio philosophy of inclusion where all sorts of minorities, religious, linguistic, cultural, and ethnic, were by and large harmoniously integrated into Iranian polity, be it before or after Islam. These, um, the, the impact of minority architects vis-a-vis -vis Pahlavi modernization should be examined on this larger historical premise. And I love this, you know, from the <laughs> Fat Ali Shah too, and they're both wearing dresses. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sayyidi Shah's ambivalent attitude towards modernization both fueled political instability, detrimental to architectural development, and laid the institutional structures upon which Pahlavi modernity would expand. In the 1930s, the agendas of the top-down and those of the bottom-up were aligned. Minority and missionary primary schools from the 1980s on, the archaeological negotiations of the 1900s that handed excavation rights to the French, the 1935 establishment of Tehran University, the construction boom of the interwar period, the Pahlavi state's aspiration to a bourgeois culture, and the endless demand of professional architects by state bureaucracy and major industry created a unique historical condition conducive to the expansion of modernism in Iran. The professional Iranian architect who emerged as the modernist protagonist was the first to benefit from and shape this unique historical moment. The ide ideology, um, that the ideology of the modern movement represented by the manifestos of Siam and the Bauhaus was founded upon a discursive distance from politics despite its overwhelming dependence on men of power, further advanced the influential yet seemingly apolitical stance of minority architects. Middle class education in Qajar, Iran was established either by foreign missionaries or the philanthropy of religious minorities. In 1865, the wealthy Parsis of Bombay paid for the first boarding school in Tehran. The first Armenian elementary school was established in Tabriz in 1879 by the community. And starting in 1898, the Alliance Israelite Universelle opened a series of Jewish schools in various Iranian cities. These were followed by, in 1900s by the opening of the, Zoroast of the first Zoroastrian girls' school in Yazd and the Baha'i Tarbiyat schools in Tehran. After the 1930s, private minority schools were not only setting academic standards, but also contemporary architectural trends. After their nationalization in 1936, they recalibrated their curriculum and opened their doors to all Iranians. Albors College, Alliance Francaise, Tarbiyat, Institut Maryam, and Lycée Razi were among the best that attracted an overwhelming majority of the Pahlavi political and cultural elite. 
and including all of the architects that I will introduce. In these novel spaces, a diverse student body commingled and formed a shared secular worldview and long, long life, um, uh, lifelong uh, friendships. By the time Muhammad Reza Shah took the throne, a new generation of urban elite with bilingual attitude and multi-perspective look upon the world was formed. Of the existing Qajar master builders, builders Ustad Neymar, none had seen a benefit in a European education, naturally. Unlike, uh, because that was not, Europe was not relevant, uh, not because they didn't know what to do, uh, it's because uh, Europe became relevant um, later. Unlike Hajar kings and bureaucrats, Reza Shah legitimized his rule by a modernist representation of the new order. While many remained active during the early Pahravi period, the Ghajar master builders' time had primarily passed. In the 1920s and 30s, the Memars, all of whom were Shia Muslims, erected numerous structures based on the techniques, styles, and materials inherited from the Ghajar building tradition. Much of their innovations laid in the 19th century style revivalism and eclecticism. Muhammad Taghi Khan Memar Bashi designed the famed Dar al Funun, the first secular school of higher learning. Commissioned by Reza Shah, the eclectic green and marble palaces were the design of Mirza Jafar Khan uh, Kashani Memar Bashi. His skill to bring the old and the new together attracted wealthy Parsis who financed the Firuz Bahram school and placed Zoroastrian MP Kehosro Shahro in charge of the project. And then he went on to um, have a major role in the uh, construction of Ferdosi's tomb. Hossein Lorzadeh designed some 800 mosques, while other Memar Bashi served as contractors to new generation of architects. Hajj Hossein Beheshti for the main post office and the police headquarter, Ustad Hajj Ali for the registrar's office and the Hassan, uh, Hassan Abad Square, and Ustad Yahya for uh, Alborz College. Uh, so it's interesting that all of these buildings are being designed either by European or uh, mostly by European architects, but the man on the ground is actually these Memar Bashis. Active alongside the Ostad Memars, or rather tailgating and pushing them out, were a handful of prolific young architects. The pragmatic Pahlavi political elite who were themselves Western educated and formed Reza Shah's first cabinet during the pivotal years from 1925 to 33, brought to Iran and supported a number of Western architects who in turn helped launch an architectural profession. However, while André Godard, Ernest Herzfeld, Arthur Pope, French architect Maxime Siraud, Tbilisi-born Russian architect Nikolai Markov, and less known German architect H. Henriks were influential in shaping architectural pedagogy and practice, they were by no means dictating the terms of their operations in the politicized environment of the 1930s. Many of them had personal relations with influential political leaders who both facilitated and curbed their works in Iran. When the reformists began to fall in the late 1930s, so did those who had not adhered to the apolitical contentions of architecture. The only Western trained Iranian architect practicing alongside them was Karim Taherzadeh Behzad, who had returned from the outdated Berlin Academy of Architecture in 1926 to join the nation building project. His eclectic revivalist, uh, revivalistic edifices were aligned with his European and Memar contemporaries. Between 1925 and 33, therefore, Diverse kinds of builders were erecting numerous types of structures in a wide range of styles, including Achaemenid, Sasanian, and Safavid revival, Rajar eclecticism, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, and Art uh, Neoclassical. The key missing element in the discourse on Pahlavi architecture was the modern movement. When in 1933, I love I the tall hats, when in 1933, Gebrekian landed in Tehran, this was the environment in which he found himself. 
He was the first, and until 1935, the sole representative of the modern movement in Iran. He brought with him not only the design principles of the international style, but also the autonomizing discourse. The reformist ministers quickly enlisted him into their efforts, where um, he took charge of the projects of Tehran's municipality. The mastermind of the 1928 civil code, Justice Minister Ali Akbar Dabar, was a staunch advocate of rapid economic growth. In an editorial in his own newspaper, Marda Ozad, Free Man, he had declared in 1923, quote, we have 6,000 years of history, but that will not translate into factories, <coughs> railroads, hospitals, and schools, unquote. Dovar must have detected in modernist that which he could not find in the memoirs, the builders who would translate 6,000 years of history in factories, hospitals, and schools. In 1935, he appointed Gevrekan as the head of the te technical department of his finance minister to guarantee the modernist look of all public constructions. Within four years, um, Gevrekan erected two dozen structures on international style principles. As of his arrival, he completed a model of a new state theater. The following year, he proposed a multipartite structure for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Lifted on concrete pilotis, the Ministry of Industries rose to seven stories of horizontal openings. In the design of the Justice Ministry in 1937, which is the last year he is in, in Iran, an uneasy compromise between the architect's avant-garde tenants and a neoclassical aesthetic favored by the state began to emerge. Gevrakian willed the greatest freedom during the design of the upper middle class villas, as he had done in France and Austria. These were the spaces of experimentation commissioned by private clients who insisted on the image of their own modernity. The modern movement rematerialized in the suburbs of northern Tehran with open plans, large minimalist openings, pilotis supporting balconies and cantilevers, and austere white walls. As in the Justice Ministry, his officers' clubs must have been, um, not been what he had envisioned, a compromise between architects' sovereignty and its dependence on the state. Gevrekian's 1937 departure from Iran coincided with the suspicious suicide of Davar. He returned to Europe and entrusted his co-religious and co-modernist Bartan Hovanesian to complete his projects. <coughs> Gevrekian and Hovanesian first met in uh, Sauvage's atelier in 1922. Considered, quote, the most prolific architect of the Reza Shah period, unquote, he spent 16 years in Paris first at the L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts and then L'Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture. In 1923, he began work for Sauvage and before opening his firm. The second modernist architect to have returned to Iran, Hovanesian, shared with Gevrekian his adamant commitment to the modern movement, although far more adaptable to Iranian uh, politics and architecture. In a 1935 letter to um, Hossein Allah, then Iran's ambassador in London, he was offered a post in the technical department of the National Police while at once submitting proposals to various private and public competitions. I wish I could write a letter and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> his background had prepared him for his first project in Iran, the Girls Art Academy, for Hovanesian had paid his way for his own education by teaching in and leading Armenian girls' school before leaving for Paris. Here he implemented a structure that would serve the needs of art and women's education where he fully applied the tenets of the international style. Elongated horizontal openings that interjected with vertical windows on corners, cantilevered staircases that, staircases that appeared to sit on stri strips of glass, classrooms that extended into balconies, and corner fans jutting out of windows and roof lines. The grand facade, while designed on a symmetrical plan, was given a volumetric distinction by a balance between negative and positive components. Following Le Corbusier's lead, 
Hovhannesian published his own five plus two points of modern architecture in the first Iranian uh, architectural journal that he founded with Iraj Moshidi. In 1938, Reza Shah commissioned a Hotel Darband on the slopes of Albors Mountain, which was praised for striking a new note of elegance and setting a tone for the modern tourist industry. This was followed by a series of edifices in the heart of Tehran. Um, um, so this is the Jeep headquarter um, and um, his uh, Cinema Diana and Cinema Metropole represented a society in transformation, one where new technology and middle class leisure were housed in explicitly modernist public yet informal spaces. Armed with a solid architectural education and, a, and often a long residency in Europe, Gevrekian and Hovhannesian were followed by other young Iranian architects who returned to Iran in the late 1930s to partake in two conflicting agendas, the establishment of a sovereign architectural profession and a rapid economic development by the state. Gathered around an embry embryonic profession, they e each approached the mainstream polity from a kind of margin. The son of prominent um, Prime Minister Mohammad Ali Forouri, Mohsen Forouri, was entirely raised in Paris before graduating from L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Uh, after his 1937 return, some had heard Forouri tell Arthur Pope, Mr. Professor, I was a young French architect who had been born in Persia assigned by some lucky quirk to be your interpreter. You opened my eyes to the beauty of my country's art. I was reborn a Persian with a French education. <laughs> Educated at the Royal College of Arts, Kehobat Zafar struggled um, as of his return in 1936 to establish himself as a respectable architect beca because he belonged to the Ilkhani Bakhtiari tribe. When Ali Sader returned from Brussels Academy of Fine Arts in 1937, he opted for the private sector, preferring to stay out of politics, but was soon drawn into the state institutions when he was elected to Tehran's city council. As the protagonist of the modernist middle class, these architects often found themselves in the precarious position um, between a heavy-handed government with which they often shared ideology and method of implementation and their own avant-garde spirit to practice without authoritarian influence. While relying on state patronage for prestigious projects, they tried to remain aloof by developing an architectural discourse that divorced their craft from political plots and royal intrigues, and there were many. Like Siam and Bauhaus, they constantly reinforced the notion that they had nothing to do with politics. In the very first editorial of L'Architecte, Moshiri declared that, quote, the architect is purely a technological and aesthetic publication which cannot and does not wish to have the slightest involvement with the world of politics. He was echoing Mrs. 1933 anxiety, architecture as a solely technical and aesthetic practice. This ambivalent, this ambivalence and this in-betweenness in which they each were already at home because of their own marginality was a crucial element in the survival of the profession and pivotal to their own life, uh, li uh, livelihood as well as the larger <coughs> nation building project. It was an anxiety dealt by many and articulated by others. Hovhannesian advocated the modern movement and its uh, autonomizing ethos by attacking the historicist national style advanced by Europeans and memoirs. In Architect, he rhetorically asked, should one imitate the past or should one look towards the future for modern life? He fervently rejected any kind of revival, invalidating his contemporaries. Godard's uh, archaeological museum, Maxim Siro's National Library, Markov's Albors College and Post Office, Tahirzadeh's Behzad Parliament, and 
Ferdos's mausoleum. To an avant-garde architect, all these revivalistic bids on being modern yet Iranian were futile. He poked fun of the neo achaemenid facades with lions and cows, dubbing them an attempt to turn Tehran into a zoo. <laughs> Being a religious minority within an affirmative action matrix was to have found oneself in a historical position that enabled the turning of marginality into a privilege. To be able to separate oneself from one's own small community and through official channels to be tossed into the international world of modernist architecture. By removing one from one's local identity politics, these young architects-to-be partook in the modern movement's universal A politics. A secular primary and secondary education, either at home or in Europe, had shaped their bilingual and worldly outlook, which led them up to, to Europe. Once trained in the West, they eagerly returned to Iran, where they found, so to speak, the best of both worlds economic prosperity, supportive communities, rich and often healthy social atmosphere, comfortable material life, favorable social mobility, a functioning patriarchy, an abundant source of income. In short, a unique historical moment. The conditions of modernity were social spaces of intervention and interaction that they had helped create. In post-war Iran, the demand for these young professionals was immense in all sectors of the rapidly developing economy, including the technical departments of the government ministries, the powerful national Iranian oil company, the Shah's plan and budget organization with its systematic five-year plans, the numerous engineering and con construction firms, the Mamet oil, gas, and petrochemical industries, and not to mention the various urban renewal and utopian schemes of the, la of the late Mohammad Reza Shah period. In the 1960s, from the social margin emerged an influential community of urban intelli intelligentsia. The new organizational sensibilities had recalibrated the ethical and aesthetic values of the new elite. Many who played an important role in shaping modern art and architecture during this period came from these margins. Hu Shang Sei Hun, the prominent dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts and the architect of key national monuments, was a Baha'i. Marcos Grigorian and uh, Animal Al Khas, pioneers of Iran's avant garde art, were Armenian and Assyrian, respectively. Eugene Aftandilian, the architect of the era-defining Rudaki concert hall, was an Armenian. David Oshana, with a dozen modernist villas in northern Tehran, was an Assyrian. Roslan Boskanyan, the architect of the 10,000-seat Ar Ararat Stadium, was an Armenian. And Hossein Amanat, the representative Pahlavi professional who redefined the modern and Iranian conundrum with his Shahyad, was a Baha'i. Many more in their ranks were women, personified in, po uh, personified in poet and film director Farouk, Farouk Zad, artist Monish Farman, Farmanian and Behjad Saad, and director of the first Iranian art gallery, Masume Sehun. Empress Farah, herself a graduate of Lycée Razi and L'Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture, became the chief patron of this diverse tastemaker after the 1959 marriage to the king. A newcomer to the royal court, a reformist of her own volition, she saw herself as one of them. In effect, an inadvertent byproduct of the inad uh, inadvertent affirmative organism. With her public image of the ideal Iranian woman as modern yet modest, she inspired many female fine art students like Baha'i architect Faize Sadir. It was during this time that women emerged as manifestations of pioneering modernity. This, not, this was not surprising given that alongside missionary schools, minority organizations, especially Baha'i and Armenians, 
had for centuries fostered women's right. So this is um, the Baha'i version and this is the Armenian version. And I bet if I dig deeper, I'll find exactly pictures of the Jewish communities and Assyrian communities. Educated women raised boys who insisted on marrying educated women, who in turn insisted on being educated and professionally active. To see me, you have been sneaking into this Donesh Kade for years. I love you and you love me, whispered Veronique into the boy's ear who was leaning on the doorway of Godard's fine arts faculty. Why won't you marry me? Ara, a handsome engineering student from Tehran University, pulled back, looked into her eyes and tenderly said, I will, sweetheart, I will marry you when you finish your degree. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened. That was a quotation. In June 1958, Veronique Saguignan completed her architectural degree at Tehran University as the highest ranking student in her class. This automatically qualified her for state scholarship to study abroad. Fururi signed her diploma, believing her to be one of the boys. The diploma had to be reissued. <laughs> On July 5, she received her golden medal in Hovhannessian Sadabad Palace, where the king met Iran's finest students. On December 28, Ara married her. She was immediately hired by Sehun and was put in charge of the new Majlis building. Four years later, Saginian began her Masters of, Sci uh, of Architecture in Chicago's IIT. At the end of her second year, Ara joined her. I would go to the Crown Hall, he recalls, and help her build the trees on her model. And that's, why I, well, that's what I mean by uh, working patriarchy. <laughs> During several afternoons, knees would come and sit at the center of his own masterpiece. They would all gather around him as if a deity Saginian would sit just a few steps from him, at times smiling. The thick smoke from his thick cigar would not bother her, despite the fact that she never smoked. During those afternoons, the faraway margins of an ancient Oriental empire, an Orthodox Christian, an Armenian, an Iranian, a woman, would come face to face with the canonical center of the modern movement. A modernist, an atheist, a German, a European, a man. Certainly the man in modern architecture. Mies would have been pleased, for Saginian was the exemplary model of the modernist architect. Aloof to politics, certain of modernity's certainty, foreign to her own marginality, and innocent to the systematic and structural violence that renders form follows function, less is more, and art for art's sake, aesthetically and ethically normative. In June 1964, she graduated and they returned to Tehran, where the rest of the Pahlavi era would be defined by the autonomizing discourse on architecture. Thank you very much.